Hello, and thank you for joining us tonight. This is Emily Stevenson, your online membership manager, and I'll be moderating tonight's event featuring our Director of Conservation Strategies, David Wolf. Before we get started, I do want to call your attention to the box marked Your Questions to the right of the slide area, which you can also make visible by clicking the red Q&A icon at the far right of the dock at the bottom of your screen. We put together this event because we want you, our members, to have all the information you could want about the work your donations make possible. Throughout the presentation, you can enter your questions for David there, and we'll get to as many as we can during the Q&A portion. If we aren't able to answer your question on the air, we'll do our best to follow up with you over email. You'll also find an icon of a clipboard in your doc. That's a quick three-question feedback survey that we hope you'll complete before signing off tonight to let us know how we did. Finally, if you're having any technical difficulties, please use the orange question mark icon at the far left of your doc to get assistance. And without any further delay, I'll turn things over to David, who's got a great presentation in store for us. David? Thank you, Emily. Uh, good evening, everyone. This is David Wolf, Director of Conservation Strategy and Habitat Markets. And I'm based in the Austin, Texas office of EDF. And I'm really pleased to have the opportunity to speak with you this evening about our Monarch Butterfly Habitat Exchange. I want to first uh, provide a little bit of information on the ecology of the species. Now, looking at this map, uh, you can see the migratory pathways and breeding ranges of the species. And there's a separation in, in the U.S. of two populations, basically. We have an eastern population, which breeds east of the Rocky Mountains, and then a western population, which breeds west of the Rocky Mountains. And one of the really interesting and unique aspects of the eastern population is what's called its multi-generational migratory behavior. Now, what does that mean? Well, it starts with the monarchs that leave their winter home in south central Mexico, and they migrate northward into the southern part of the United States, Texas and Oklahoma, in the early spring. And this first generation of monarchs lays their eggs on milkweeds in those states. Those eggs become caterpillars, which in turn become butterflies. And then the second generation migrates further north and repeats the cycle and so on for four generations. Now, this fourth generation, which was born in the northern reaches of the United States and even southern Canada, begins heading back south towards Mexico in the fall when the weather starts getting cooler. And the amazing thing is that this generation has never been to the Mexican wintering grounds. It, it was their great-grandparents that left there roughly seven months earlier. So I find that just to be an amazing and, and a really unique phenomenon uh, among the in insect world. Now, I also mentioned this western population of monarchs, which is quite a bit smaller than the eastern population. It, it also goes through a migration process, but it's a shorter trip, and it's not that multi-generational phenomenon that we see in the east. Uh, in the west, uh, the monarchs there spend the winter on the California coast, and then they migrate inland uh, as spring and summer arrive and breed on milkweeds in places like the Central Valley of California. But let's zoom into that wintering habitat in South Central Mexico for a minute. This is another amazing part of monarch biology where in the past it was millions of monarch butterflies uh, would cluster in the forest in the mountains in South Central Mexico and they gather on, primarily on OML fir trees. Uh, in recent times the numbers have dropped to, to hundreds of thousands of monarchs clustering there during the winter. And Looking at this chart, we, what scientists have actually done is track the area that these monarchs occupy in, in the forested habitats down there. And that's a surrogate for actually tracking the size of the population, because you can imagine in the breeding range with the monarchs constantly on the move and the fact that they're, they're spread across much of the country, it's really pretty much impossible to track the population in the breeding range. But they can do a really good job of tracking the population by the size of the area they occupy in the wintering range. And so this is what this chart represents, the area that they occupy in that range. And you can see that the trend has been downward over about the past 20 years. So in about 1996, uh, 
they occupied about 21 hectares. That's hectares, so you multiply it times 2.5, get acres, about 50 acres in 1996. And then in the winter of 2013, 2014, it was down to about 0.7 hectares, which is something like uh, an acre and a half. So it's an incredible drop in the population. And as a result of this decline, uh, a number of groups, the Center for Biological Diversity, Center for Food Safety, the Xerxes Society, uh, have petitioned the Secretary of Interior to, to list the monarch butterfly as a threatened species. Well, what's been happening? What, what's caused this decline? Well, the science tells us that the, the, the region what, that we call the Corn Belt in the Midwest has been very important for breeding for monarchs. And historically, this is an area of, of prairie habitat, uh, which had a, a lot of wildflowers, in particular milkweed and other wildflowers, to support monarch breeding and nectaring. But then, uh, with human settlement came cultivation, agriculture, a lot of corn is grown in that region, a lot of soy. Uh, but even uh, then, for many years, there were still a lot of weeds within the fields, adjacent to the fields, enough to still do a pretty good job of supporting monarch butterfly breeding. But then, over the last 20 years or so, we've seen widespread adoption of genetically modified crops, Roundup Ready corn, Roundup Ready soy, as well as the development of glyphosate herbicides such as Roundup. And those things have led to a lot more spraying of herbicide, in particular glyphosate herbicide. And the small chart there just shows the increase over the last 20, 25 years or so. Uh, in the application of glyphosate. What that has resulted in uh, is essentially clean farming. Uh, no more milkweed, in fact, very few weeds at all uh, within or adjacent to the cultivated fields there. Now, there are other reasons as well uh, for monarch decline, and there's actually a debate in the scientific literature right now as to how important a uh, loss of milkweed is as compared to some other reasons, such as fragmentation of habitat. You know, I mentioned the Corn Belt as being important for breeding, but that whole migratory pathway for the eastern population from Texas up through Minnesota is obviously vitally important for the species, and so you've got things like suburbanization going on, causing habitat fragmentation. In the southern part of the range, Texas and Oklahoma, which is primarily rangelands, um, we've got loss of, uh, of nectaring plants due to things like overgrazing, fire suppression. So while loss of milkweed is obviously important, um, there, there are other threats as well that need to be addressed when conserving this species. What do we need to turn this situa situation around? Well, we need to get milkweed back into the landscape, particularly in the agricultural landscape. And as, as well as nectar plants, and we need to work on improving connectivity of habitat for the monarch as well. In the agricultural landscape, we are looking at opportunities to restore habitat in places like field edges, uh, buffer zones, uh, yards. Even the yards on a lot of these farms are, are several acres in size and so can actually be a habitat patch for the monarch. And then marginal fields is a big category. There's a lot of land being cultivated where there's minimal to no return on investment for the farmer. And so if they can have an opportunity to restore and conserve habitat for the monarch and receive income for that, that's a huge incentive for them to turn those marginal fields into habitat for the monarch. So the, we see a lot of opportunities in the agricultural landscape uh, this list here for farms and obviously rangeland uh, opportunities in the southern part of the range uh, create the potential for a lot of acreage of restoration for the monarch. As many of you probably know, EDF has a long history of working cooperatively with private landowners on conservation of species. We worked then on conservation of species like the golden cheek warbler in Texas, New England cottontail in the Northeast, and in recent years, the greater sage-grouse. 
And, you know, it's our belief that it's much better to work with these landowners on proactive conservation, uh, to get a lot of conservation on the ground, to potentially keep species off the endangered species list. The Endangered Species Act is a really important tool for us uh, and, and creates uh, a driver for development interest to invest in conservation. But the, the challenge is uh, the Endangered Species Act is such that by the time a species is considered for listing, it's often uh, in a situation where it's, it needs intensive care, basically. Uh, it's, it's in a, a dire situation. It's much more difficult to turn the situation around when it reaches that point. So our experience is that if we can work proactively before a species hits the endangered species list, we have a much better chance of turning the situation around, recovering the species. And so our experience has been very positive when working with farmers and ranchers to achieve that. And all of our experience with private landowners has led to the development of these habitat exchanges. So what, what does the habitat exchange look like? Well, on the supply side, it's, it's private landowners, it's the farmers and ranchers who have the land and can generate the conservation for the species. And for the monarch on the demand side, uh, it's, it's groups like agribusiness, the companies that make the, uh, the genetically modified crops and the glyphosate herbicide, the fly, sub food supply chain companies um, who you know, provide the market for these landowners, basically. It's philanthropic foundations and the general public. Also, uh, the U.S. Department of Agriculture is, is keenly interested in pollinators and the monarch and has increasingly expressed an interest in approaches that uh, provide a, a, a market-based system for landowner participation in, in conservation. And that's what the exchange does. It, it provides them a marketplace similar to how a, a commodity exchange marketplace for, for corn or cotton or whatever the crop might be. So they're very familiar with that kind of system, and they understand how the market works and how exchange might work. So they can relate very easily to an exchange that is a marketplace for habitat for a species. So in the monarch exchange, uh, it, would, it would connect those demand sources uh, with the private landowners, uh, enable them to make income from generating uh, habitat for the monarch butterfly, uh, and that, that habitat would be quantified as credits, and I'm going to talk about that in just a minute, uh, that they would sell to the demand side. And if we were in a regulatory situation, if, if the monarch ends up on the list, then some of those entities on the demand side uh, will be obligated, you know, regulated through the Endangered Species Act to buy credits. But we're not there yet, thankfully. Uh, we still have a good opportunity to, to turn the situation around for the monarch. So all of those investments in con uh, conservation with private landowners will go directly towards recovery of the species, which is our goal. Now, I mentioned credits. Well, how do we calculate those? We have developed uh, these tools called habitat quantification tools, which measure the quality of habitat in addition to the acreage, because we know that uh, all acres are not equal to the species, uh, one, equal may, one acre in one place may be much higher quality uh, and more important to the species than an acre somewhere else. And so the scientists uh, have told us what is important for the monarch, and it's things like milkweed abundance, milkweed diversity, nectar plant abundance, nectar plant diversity. Uh, they, they know from their research that those are the factors that are important to the monarch butterfly as well as what's going on in the surrounding landscape. So is it, is it a native prairie? Is it a cultivated field? Is it a parking lot? Obviously, those things have an impact on the monarch butterfly. So we're working with the scientists to uh, tell us how important all those different attributes are to the monarch butterfly. And that leads us to this concept of functional acres. So we actually go through a calculation um, based on those habitat characteristics to calculate what we call the functionality of habitat. So, for example, if we had 10 acres and it was, had, had the perfect amount of milkweed and diversity of milkweed and nectar plants and the surrounding landscape was as good as it can be, that 10 acres would be 10 functional acres. Uh, if it were 50% as good as it could be, that would be five functional acres. 
So this this concept works really well with private landowners because they understand what it means, and then they can get a better picture of what they might need to do to improve that functionality. And it's the functional acres they have which we equate to credits, which they can then market through the exchange. And here's an example of our recent work. We've been developing this habitat quantification tool with uh, Karen Oberhauser and her team from the Monarch Lab at the University of Minnesota. Uh, Karen's got many decades of experience working with the Monarch Butterfly uh, and, and has been uh, just super to work with on development of this quantification tool and the exchange itself. Uh, and here's some of her, her research team out in the field with us at Shield Ranch in Central Texas just about three or four weeks ago where we're testing that quantification tool uh, by, by doing these scientific transects and measuring the uh, diversity and abundance of milkweed and the same thing for next plants, uh, gathering the data, testing the tool. And then we're going to repeat this process uh, in California and then in the Midwest later in the summer as the flowering plants there really get going. So we're very excited about, about the results of that. And I just wanted to share with you also while we were out there uh, we found a number of, we were a little late for uh, the, the, the peak of the monarch breeding season there, but we did find a number of caterpillars on the antelope horns milkweed there, so I'm really excited to report that. <clears throat> we have some ambitious goals for the habitat exchange, but we need to be ambitious uh, in order to recover the monarch. <clears throat> Our goal is to restore 2 million acres of, of habitat within the next 10 years in the, the eastern population. And then with a the smaller western population, a little bit more modest goal of 200,000 acres over the same time period. What will that mean for private landowners? Well, it's, it's a pretty strong financial incentive. By our estimates, it's going to be somewhere in the neighborhood of $3.5 $3 billion going to farmers and ranchers uh, over the next 10 years uh, for restoration of habitat. So that's, that's a really significant incentive for them to participate. What are all the benefits for these private landowners? Obviously, the income is important, but we've also discovered in our many decades of work with private landowners that it's not, not always about the money. Uh, these folks have, do have a stewardship ethic. They, they typically want to do the right thing for species, water quality, and so on, the other environmental concerns that we have. Um, but they, they want to be supported you know, in, in doing those things. So. The money is important, but ed educating them about, say, the biology of the species uh, and how important their particular patch of habitat is within the overall scheme of things. So there, there's a number of things we can do to help foster uh, their own stewardship values in addition to money, which are really important uh, that they you know, do a good job, continue the restoration into the future. Uh, and, and also help us encourage their neighbors to participate. So it's, it's not just all about the money. Uh, so other things contributing to the recovery and avoiding listing, obviously avoiding the regulatory driver, if, if at all possible, benefiting other pollinators, which is important to a number of crops. On the demand side, obviously some of the same benefits, but also for things like agribusiness, it helps them to meet their sustainability goals. Uh, it creates jobs in that, you know, in, in operating the exchange, we will need technical service folks to work with the farmers, uh, folks to run the habitat quantification tool. There'd be a variety of, of jobs created through this effort. I wanted to say a little bit about the timeline in, in where we are and what our plans are for the future. We are currently engaging a wide variety of partners. I, I mentioned the development of the habitat quantification tool with the, the folks at the Monarch Lab at the University of Minnesota. Uh, that's just one example of groups that we're working with. We're, we're now a member of the Monarch Joint Venture, uh, which is a lot of agencies and NGOs that are committed to the conservation and recovery of this species. Uh, we're also members of the, the Keystone Monarch Collaborative, which has brought in a a diversity of stakeholders from agribusiness to national level agricultural organizations to uh, work on key challenges related to recovering the species. We're in the process of joining the Iowa Monarch Conservation Consortium. Iowa is a key state in the Corn Belt 
for recovery of this species, so it's an important place for us to to uh, launch and sustain a habitat exchange. Uh, I mentioned design of the HQT. We're in the process of testing that tool now and look forward to applying it in the fall. Uh, we're working with these stakeholders to design the exchange, which includes development of what we call an exchange manual. It's like an operations manual, which describes how a farmer participates, as well as how, say, an agribusiness or food supply company uh, might participate in the exchange. Uh, it's basically an operating manual with, with rules and protocols. So we're in the process of develop, developing that. Uh, we expect to be selecting uh, some initial administrators to start getting underway later this fall and to be doing some pilot testing at the same time. And our goal is to uh, begin implementation in some of the, the key important areas for the monarch in early 2017. So that would be I mentioned Iowa early, that's a key priority state for us. Uh, the southern part of the range, Texas is also vitally important uh, for breeding and, and migration. Uh, and then California, uh, we also expect to begin operations in California early next year. And then the goal is to expand outward across the, the migratory and breeding range from those uh, key initial states. With that, I'd be happy to uh, start addressing some questions. Great. Thank you so much, David. Um, we've already got some great questions coming in from our members at home. If you joined us a few minutes late, we have been recording this whole presentation, and we'll continue through the questions and answers to do so. And we'll be emailing you a link to watch it on demand in the next couple of days. Uh, speaking of emails from us, we'll also be keeping you up to date on our Monarch Habitat Exchange all summer long, uh, including an online journal that Dave will be posting in while he's out in the field this summer. So our first question is from William, um, who asked, what is agribusiness's incentive to participate in these land exchanges? Well, there, there's uh, at least a couple of incentives that I would uh, highlight. Um, one is these companies, Monsanto, Syngenta, BASF, DuPont, uh, others, um, recognize that there's now peer-reviewed science indicating that uh, glyphosate herbicide has led to a decline in, in milkweeds, particularly in the corn belt. And so they, they have that recognition, and um, many of them have stepped up and indicated that they – they, they want to try to offset that loss, so that's that's laudable. Um, the other driver for these companies uh, is, in fact, uh, the petition for listing of the monarch. So there is a potential within the next couple of years for the monarch to be listed as a threatened species. Uh, and that listing would result uh, probably in some restrictions on activities within monarch breeding and migratory habitat. So it's, it's there is some potential that some of these herbicides could be uh, restricted and regulated. And so it's in the best interest of these companies to invest in habitat restoration and conservation now and turn the situation around for the monarch uh, before a listing because of that potential restriction. Great. Our next question is from... Uh, let's see here, Amanda, who asks, are there any opportunities for municipalities to participate in the exchange? Uh, potentially so. Our, our, our target certainly is initially the agricultural community uh, because the science has indicated that that's where the, the greatest opportunity is uh, in terms of just vast acreages of, of farms and ranch lands to restore habitat. Uh, but the exchange is, is really intended to be kind of an, an open marketplace, so to speak, for, for buyers and sellers um, of, of all types to come and, and sell or buy habitat credits. So um, that there are lots of opportunities now for municipalities to, to get funding through various foundations. Uh, in particular, I, mean, I mentioned one, the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation um, is uh, has a, a yearly grant program, and I know a lot of municipalities are, are taking advantage of that right now, so there's an immediate opportunity. 
but there there is potential in the future as we launch exchanges uh, that they might potentially take advantage of the exchange uh, as a mechanism for them to invest in conservation. Great. Uh, next up is our question from Bonnie, who asks where the three point five billion dollars is going to come from. Well, our, our vision is that it will be a massive private-public partnership, funding partnership, uh, bigger than I think anything we've seen before in terms of species recovery. So we're, we're expecting agribusiness, chemical companies, seed companies to invest. Um, we've had good success with our ag sustainability program in influencing uh, agricultural supply chains. So all of the, basically the middlemen uh, in between, say, a farmer, um, you know, and uh, the grocery store, uh, influencing them to, uh, you know, start requiring uh, certain practices um, of the farmers and to potentially uh, make the investment um, in, in monarch conservation. So it's food supply companies, agribusiness. Uh, we've got philanthropic foundations who... They're, they're interested in, um, in investing money in conservation, which is what I call highly accountable. In other words, knowing exactly what they're getting for their money and using our habitat quantification tool, uh, we can do that. It's much more sophisticated than measuring just acres because we're lo actually looking at the functionality of habitat. So we're talking to a number of foundations uh, that are interested in, in using that kind of tool to, to invest their money. Um, and then uh, federal funding through U.S. Department of Agriculture uh, has also expressed a lot of interest in recent years in these market-based systems with the idea being you want to get as much conservation for each dollar invested as possible. So it's, it's a diversity of sources, and um, I'm, I'm working with our economists now here at EDF to uh, identify, uh, you know, basically a a plan for how much money is needed and what sectors, what are those sectors of the demand side where we think the money should come from to turn the situation around. Thank you. Our next question is from Barbara who asks for more information about what an administrator will do. Well, the administrator has a variety of roles, and it, it actually can change over time. Uh, typically, um, early on, the administrator will wear a lot of different hats. Um, I mean, they will conduct outreach to farmers and ranchers about the program and its opportunities. Uh, they might help the, the farmer or rancher with management planning. Uh, so to get the management plan in place, uh, there's typically a, a contract for a period of time to get the habitat uh, established and maintained for a period of years, and sometimes there'll be an easement if it's a, uh, a permanent commitment to conservation. In that case, the exchange administrator would work with a land trust to hold the easement, um, monitoring of the site, uh, payments to landowners to, to maintain the site, so it's a variety of roles, and then as as participation grows, typically the exchange administrator would be become primarily responsible for tracking the transactions between the landowners and the demand side, whether it's agribusiness or a private foundation, for example, and would have you know either staff or there might be consultants or contractors who would start handling uh, all that uh, diverse array of duties that I was mentioning. Um, so it, it, it kind of depends on the scale, but the, the job kind of ranges everything from, from outreach to tracking transactions to making the payments to monitoring and so on. That's great. We have um, two questions up here that are two people thinking along very much the same lines as each other. Um, Cheryl asks if the Northeast is responsible for keeping the milkweed growing, and Leslie asks, what are monarch butterfly nectar plants, and is it helpful for people to plant them in their backyards in the Northeast? Um, the, the Northeast, um, what, what, no, I'm sorry, repeat the question for the Northeast. 
Yes. Um, is it helpful for people to plant milkweed and other monarch butterfly nectar plants in the Northeast, and, and what are some of the nectar plants? Okay. So, uh, yes. I mean, it, it is helpful um, to plant um, uh, milkweed plants there. With, with the loss of milkweed um, in, in the Corn Belt, the monarchs have adapted to some degree by, by moving out, you know, to other um, non-cultivated areas, for example, roadways and so on. Uh, so that's that's helped to some degree to, to mitigate the loss, but not nearly enough. So uh, from my read of the science, some of those other areas of the country, the Northeast, for example, are probably m more important than they have been historically. So a absolutely, yes. I mean, it is important to plant milkweeds, specifically native milkweeds. And I... I'm sorry, but I can't tell you what the particular species in the Northeast would be, uh, but the Xerxes Society, uh, X-E-R-C-E-S dot org, Xerxes dot org, uh, has a number of great uh, manuals on the milkweeds for different regions of the country uh, and any even sources where you can go get them. Um, so we strongly recommend native local sources if possible. Uh, so Xerxes is a great source for information on which milkweed and nectar plants would be appropriate for, for your particular part of the country. Great. And I will put in a shameless plug here. We are in the middle of our annual fund campaign, which funds so much of our important work, including the Habitat Exchange. We do have a deadline tomorrow night. If you haven't given yet, we'd love if you went onto our website and, and made a gift to the annual fund and, and adopted an acre of milkweed for yourself. Our next question up is from Michelle, who asks, given the precipitous population decline to such extremely low levels, is this in time to drive recovery? Yes. <clears throat> I mean, we believe it is. And are in consultation with the other monarch experts, so that's people like Karen Oberhauser, who I mentioned earlier, uh, Chip Taylor with Monarch Watch in Kansas, John Pleasance at Iowa State, uh, they definitely believe that, that we do have a window of opportunity to turn the situation around. I mean, the good news is that restoring something like milkweed and nectar plants is something that can be done relatively quickly. Uh, it's, you know, it's a matter of just a few years rather than decades and decades. So that that gives us this opportunity. And the fact that um, we, we've got such great interest from the public in helping this species and the fact that EDF has, has many decades of working cooperatively with farmers and ranchers across the country on a variety of species through these incentive-based programs, uh, that gives me a, a lot of op optimism that we, we definitely have a, you know, a great window of opportunity over the next several years to to get a lot of habitat restored and conserved and turn the situation around for the monarch. Great, thank you. Uh, we have a great question coming up from Pamela. Does the growing consumer pressure to label GMO foods and potential reduced demand for GMO crops show up on the grower's radar screens yet? And does it create an incentive to participate in monarch conservation as proactive change of land use? That is a great question. We have um, we have a group of farmers, primarily from the Midwest, but a few from the Great Plains as well. Uh, it's it's our top producer network that um, helps advise us and inform us on you know kind of gives us a sense of what the the pulse of what's going on in the farming community is, and they they are definitely aware of issues like, you know, labeling of food that's, that's uh, GMO food, issues like glyphosate, um, that, that's definitely on their radar screen. And there's been uh, a strong, I think, a strong receptivity to doing beneficial things for the monarch. Uh, and, and the challenge has been, and let me just say that there's, you know, there's a lot of conservation work going on for the monarch and, you know, schoolyards, rock uh, folks planting gardens, which is all great and all needed. Um, and, and the reason we felt that it was important to step into to working on the monarch was the habitat exchange as a tool is designed to 
engage agricultural landowners in large numbers in conservation, and that seemed to be the big gap in monarch conservation. And our experience has been that, uh, so far, has been that farmers are, they understand the issue, uh, they, they want to help, they need a mechanism by, by which to help, and the habitat exchange is really well suited to providing that mechanism. Great. Our next question is from Lauren, who asks, is Mexico doing what it needs to do to help the recovery process? Uh, Mexico uh, is doing a fair amount of work in dealing with things like illegal logging, which is one of the big threats uh, down there in the southern part of the uh, southern part of the range. Um, we are keeping an eye on the situation in Mexico, again, in our consultation with the monarch experts about what are the key threats and the key bottlenecks to turning the situation around for the monarch. It's, it's fairly unanimous that the problem is primarily in the breeding range right now as to why the population has been declining. So we are focusing our efforts on the breeding range through the, the mechanism of the habitat exchange first. However, we are definitely keeping an eye on the Mexican situation. Uh, we have good partnerships uh, with a number of Mexican partners, such as Pro Natura, uh, Mexican conservation NGO, and we're, we're, we're you know, going to monitor that situation. And if there is an opportunity for us to uh, provide some value in terms of reducing threats there, uh, we will definitely step in and take advantage of doing that. That's wonderful. Our next question is from Bonnie, who asks if you see any connection between the honeybee and the monarch, and which is in worse shape. Uh, and I'm I'm not an expert on honeybees. Uh, I would say, uh, in in my interaction with folks who are focused on the honeybees, uh, I mean certainly there there are some similarities uh, in in terms of um, in, impacts from things like insecticides, loss of nectaring plants. So there's definitely some similarities in terms of threats there. My understanding of the science is that, that the monarch is in greater need of conservation uh, at the current time, but obviously uh, a lot of pollinators are in need of help, you know, bees, beetles, flies, moths, uh, a variety of insects. Um, and so that, you know, our, our immediate goal with the Monarch Habitat Exchange is to, to get it up quickly, get investments uh, going quickly to farmers and ranchers to restore habitat that will benefit the Monarch. But we are also already looking at um, the, the, the co-benefits, what are the other things that will benefit from this, this kind of habitat, and, and clearly a lot of other pollinators will benefit from that. And so I think very soon uh, we'll be expanding our quantification tool to start, you know, actually measuring what those specific things, uh, specific benefits to other pollinators, uh, bees, and so on will be. Because uh, we see an opportunity here to uh, not just benefit the monarch, but a suite of other pollinators. And then in this migratory corridor from Texas to Minnesota is also very important for a lot of birds, a lot of grassland birds uh, rely on habitat that are important for monarch and pollinators. So we're looking at this with a long-term view of, of benefiting uh, a variety of other species that are you know, at risk to some degree right now. Great. Our next question is from Richard, who says, David, you mentioned that many farmers are interested in stewardship and doing the right thing. Are you encountering any resistance or opposition from any of the stakeholders? And what are the biggest obstacles to success? We, we have had, uh, you know, we, we, we really deliberated uh, quite a bit uh, before deciding to begin work on a monarch habitat exchange, because it was clear to us that a lot of a lot of organizations, a lot of nonprofit conservation groups, and so on, were working on mon monarch conservation, uh, but they they really made it clear to us that there was this big gap in being able to connect with the agricultural community, um, which which was that was sorely needed in terms of of monarch conservation. So 
we we have really had amazingly positive uh, receptivity from a wide variety of stakeholders to the Monarch Habitat Exchange, particularly from a variety of conservation organizations, groups I've mentioned like Monarch Joint Venture and Iowa Monarch Consortium uh, and so on, um, ha have indicated a lot of interest in this approach. And we have also had, uh, we've been in the room with groups like National Wheat Growers, National Corn Growers, uh, Cattlemen's Associations, and they have had a very, very positive response as well. So I, th I think there's potential for great participation on the supply uh, side. Uh, I think, you know, obviously there'll be a number of challenges uh, to doing this. I think one of the, the big challenges will be uh, getting agribusiness to make the level of investment that's needed to really turn the situation around. You know, in other words, uh, we, we literally need millions of acres of new habitat uh, for the monarch uh, because of all the acreage that's been lost. Uh, and if you, you, you do the math on the cost of the seed and, and uh, site preparation and restoring habitat, it's a substantial amount of money that's needed. And, and we think, uh, you know, the, the public should not have all the burden of paying that. Uh, these private companies who are uh, making income from these kinds of seeds and glyphosate and so on should step up to the plate and make a major investment here. And so that, that may be one of the key challenges we face in getting to the scale that we need to get. Uh, but we, we've had a good start with a lot of the stakeholders, and we think because of the, the driving pressures here to do the right thing for the monarch and the potential ESA listing, we're pretty confident that uh, we're going to see uh, the demand come in at the level we need to see it. That's really great to hear. Our next question is from Barbara, who asks, will the exchange be focused on the central flyway, and will it use the USDA heat chart or areas of priority? We Yes, we will. We will focus uh, in the Corn Belt and that central migratory flyway, uh, as well as California. We will have an effort there because we already have an existing uh, Central Valley Habitat Exchange in the works. So it's uh, it's a multi-species exchange, and we'll we'll just be adding the mo the monarch to the list of species they can accommodate there. Um, we will be. Um, I'm, I'm not familiar with the term heat chart, but there is a monarch conservation. Uh, science partnership that USGS, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and most, if not all, those key scientists I mentioned are part of. And they, and actually now the now that I think about it, that the, the map is like a heat chart, which shows uh, dark blues and reds and yellows of different priority areas. I just hadn't hadn't heard of it being referred to as a heat chart, but that's now that I think about it, that's exactly what it looks like. Um, so yes, absolutely. Um, we will be using their map to prioritize uh, where the exchange will focus, and we will actually be taking that into account with our quanti habitat quantification tool, uh, because the quantification tool looks at specific attributes of the individual site, but it also takes into account what's going on at multiple scales beyond the site, so the landscape and then you know even bigger surrounding areas, uh, and so we can actually incorporate uh, that heat chart uh, that the Monarch uh, Conservation Science Partnership has put together into our quantification tool. So we make sure that we prioritize conservation uh, in the areas where the science tells us it needs to happen. Well, that's always a, an EDF answer. Our next question is from Jerry, who asks, restoring monarch habitat is really important, but what about climate change? Are monarchs threatened long-term by the threat of warmer climates and more extreme weather? Almost certainly, yes. Uh, I mean, obviously, most species, certainly at-risk species, who have some sensitivity to, to variety of threats uh, are threatened by climate change. We're already seeing, I think, some of the impacts of climate change uh, on the monarch, changing the timing of when they're starting their fall migration, for example. Uh, we're also seeing things like some overwintering on the Texas coast, um, which uh, 
I mean, if I had to guess, I would say that that may be due to climate change. So it's it's definitely a threat, um, and, and and we need to address it as best we can. And that's one of the uh, the, the the powerful components of the habitat exchange is our ability to shift priorities over time uh, if they happen to shift for the species. You know, historically, a lot of conservation has been based on permanent easements to put a permanent easement in place and theoretically protect uh, a species in perpetuity of a particular site. So we're discovering with things like climate change that that tool alone may not do the job. If, if a species range shifts over the next 20, 30, 50, 100 years, um, we, and we've invested all in the permanent conservation of a few sites. Uh, well, the species may have, the habitat may have shifted, the species may have moved. And obviously, we're, we're already seeing rain shifts for a lot of species. I mean, butterflies in particular uh, have been shown in the science to, to shift their ranges. So we, the habitat exchange is a tool that has some flexibility. Uh, to direct the investments to the places where the species need it the most. And if, if it happens to shift over time, which it's likely to do because of climate change, then we can adjust our quantification tool and shift those priorities over time. Great. Our next question is from Cynthia, who asks, what about threats to the overwintering habitat in Mexico, such as from logging? Well, it's it's definitely a threat, um, and but again, the you know the, the the experts have indicated to us the immediate threat is is the breeding range, so we're focusing on that in the near term. Um, but we, you know, as I mentioned, we're we're going to monitor the overwintering site because obviously, for a migratory species, you've got to have the whole package of wintering, breeding, and migratory habitat. Uh, you know, you can't if you just focus on one, you you may um, lose the whole thing. So, you know, we're we're going to keep an eye on the wintering habitat. We're going to stay in contact with uh, Mexican colleagues. I, I mentioned ProNatura. There are obviously other groups that are working as well on conservation in Mexico. Um, you know, we we have um, uh, an extensive network of folks working in Mexico through our Oceans Program. So we're going to keep an eye on that. Um, I, you know, I can't say that we have a immediate um, way for them to participate in the habitat exchange, but we're going to evaluate how we can take advantage of opportunities to uh, potentially invest in conservation in Mexico, and that that may be something that we end up doing within the next few years if if the need becomes great enough where it it becomes a priority. Thank you. Our next question is from Cheryl, who asks uh, if someone she knows can enroll in the Habitat Exchange. <laughs> well, we will once uh, once the exchanges are up and running. Uh, actually, probably while we're doing pilot tests, we will start putting uh, on the web uh, screening criteria, basically. How, how a person, a farmer, rancher, landowner would participate. So it'll describe kind of the, uh, the criteria um, that there'll probably be some kind of minimum acreage requirement for participation, although uh, monarchs can benefit from, from very small acreage restoration projects. So, you know, it's, it's not going to be like a 50-acre minimum or 100-acre minimum. It's going to be something relatively small. Uh, because basically for the monarch, we need a lot of small patches across the landscape. We don't necessarily need 1,000-acre restoration projects. Uh, we just need a whole lot of 5-, 10-, and 20-acre projects uh, across the landscape. Um, but we will, we will get online, um, ideally this fall, kind of a list of what the participation criteria are, uh, as well as... Um, I mentioned that operations manual, which describes how a farmer, rancher, landowner would participate. So expect to see later this year kind of details on uh, what, what's needed in order to participate in the exchange. Thank you. 
And we have a question from Amanda who wants to know what other species EDS is currently working on or what comes after the monarch. Well, we uh, are also uh, working on, you know, a number of other species across the country with the habitat exchange approach. One is the greater sage grouse, which has a range covering about 11 states in the West and uh, have had some recent great successes there. Uh, the, the, the first operational exchange is underway in Nevada. The Nevada Conservation Credit System is doing its first transactions. We're very excited about that. Uh, and actually, as a result of the exchanges that we're working on for the greater sage grouse, and that would be Nevada and Colorado and Wyoming and some nascent eff uh, efforts in a couple of other states, uh, because of those efforts uh, and the other conservation that was going on for the greater sage grouse, uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service decided that there was there was enough positive momentum toward the end of last year they decided not to list the greater sage grouse. So we see that as a you know a very a great victory in you know turning the situation around for that species. Um, in California, we have our Central Valley Habitat Exchange. Uh, that's a multi-species exchange for species like the Swainson's hawk, which is a state-listed species in California, uh, giant garter snake, uh, which is a, a federally listed species there. Um, they're, they're evaluating a number of other species uh, for possible inclusion. Uh, they will include the monarch butterfly uh, as soon as we get our quantification tool done within the next few months. We also have, uh, uh, we're working uh, on a stream a restoration quantification tool, uh, which will eventually include uh, aquatic species. Uh, that's That effort is underway in North Carolina. And we are looking also at other opportunities in the southeast in the United States. Uh, there's a lot of listed species down there. Uh, we've got longleaf pine habitat, species like the gopher tortoise, uh, which is a candid species in the eastern part of its range. So we're talking with, uh, with folks uh, uh, I mean, one example would be from the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission about uh, potentially putting in place a habitat exchange there for for one or multiple species. So we're very excited that this is this is being recognized by a lot of different agencies and organizations across the country as a, a really powerful tool for achieving, especially landscape scale conservation goals. Well, that's a, a lot of animals that need our help, and hopefully we'll get to all of them. Um, it looks like we've actually managed to answer everyone's questions tonight, uh, so I think we'll go ahead and wrap it up here. Thank you all so much for your attendance and for your thoughtful questions and for caring so much about these butterflies that need our help. We will be getting a recording of this event out to you in the next day or two, and as we promised, updates on our Monarch Habitat Exchange all summer long from the field. Before you go, please take a few moments to complete our quick three-question feedback survey and let us know how we did tonight. Uh, thank you again. Have a great night. David, did you want to say anything else? Uh, just thank you for the opportunity to speak with you, and, and thank you for your, your interest and your commitment to things like monarch conservation. Great. Have a great night, everyone.